Canada is a huge and beautiful country. I was slightly skeptical on my way here, but it turned out for nothing. There is much to see and much to show. In this new big episode, we'll fly across Canada east-west, check out Toronto and Vancouver, visit the extremely beautiful Banff and Jasper National Parks, and take a look at Niagara Falls. Then, this will be our ride to the Athabasca Glacier, and this one to some orcas. Well, and not just them. We'll pay a visit to a newly opened cannabis shop and try to look into weed legalization in Canada. We'll talk to some guys who moved here and check out how they settled down. After, a seaplane takes us over Vancouver. I'll show you several cool places and other exciting stuff, a short preview can't cover. So pack your things up and let's go! Let's start our trip around Canada with a well-known city with a spire. Alright friends, as we always do, before we begin, let's check how much you know about Canada. Answer this one simple and traditional question. The capital of Canada is Vancouver, Montreal, ok, I won't fool around with you as I did in Australia, so I'll add just one more option. Or is it Toronto? I hope you all got it right, because it's not Vancouver, not Montreal and not Toronto either, it's Ottawa. How can you trust people after this? Toronto really is not the capital, although it's the largest city in Canada with an agglomeration of about 6 million people. Well, let's go and check out the city. The first thing that catches the eye is that Toronto looks very similar to New York. See for yourselves. Same police cars, signs, yellow traffic lights, school buses, public transport, hot dog food trucks. The architecture is pretty much the same. Here's a skyscraper and a homeless person sleeping tight just on the sidewalk. And for sure, it's a spitting image of New York. For this reason, Toronto is often used to depict New York in Hollywood movies. Firstly, it's much cheaper to film here than in the US. And secondly, the stage design is almost ready. The they usually just change the street signs as they have different colors in Toronto and underground signs. And there you have it, New York. There's even a substitute for Times Square in Toronto called Yanni Dundas Square, which also has a crazy number of screens and crowds of people. Another popular film set in Toronto is this place. As filming at Harvard is prohibited, the University of Toronto usually acts the part. This cool campus will turn any bad student into a first-class graduate in just a few years. All in all, if you choose the right spots for pictures, you can disguise your trip to Toronto as a trip to New York, and nobody gonna know. Toronto has some city symbols, the CN Tower being the major one, with a height of 553 meters, the tallest structure in the Western Hemisphere. Another is a Toronto Maple Leafs hockey team. You can see quite a lot of Eastern European surnames in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Even though the Toronto Raptors became NBA champions of 2019, hockey is a national sport here. And although beavers are considered Canada's symbol, I would say the same about squirrels. There are thousands of them here, if not tens of thousands. They are the main animals on the street here, feeling so relaxed that they even eat like royals, laying down. Back in school we used to study geography using books and maps. Now though, there is a new, more modern and most importantly, more truthful way to learn it. Yes, guys, memes. So let's have a Canada meme review. Canada is one of the leading countries in the meme industry, so Google effortlessly provides really valuable results if you do a quick search. The main meme here is Meanwhile in Canada. The number one topic here is the weather, specifically how cold it's here. Most jokes from other countries float about this. How cold can be in Toronto at winter? Ah, minus 30? Minus 40 something. Minus 40? 40. 45 something. Yep, it can get extremely cold in Canada, and the thing is that seasons are nominal here. It's winter, 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 then boom, summer right away. The heat resistance of locals also varies greatly. Some wear full coats and hats, while others feel comfy in shirts. That's why the weather is most discussed here and not politics. It's uncommon in Canada to talk politics, because it only bothers Canadians in two cases. Namely, if it impacts their taxes or minimum wages, which in turn impact their taxes. 
So everything boils down to money. And still, politics doesn't affect them too much, so people don't talk about it. Everyone talks about the weather. The next meme is Canadian politeness in all possible scenarios. Like, someone stepped on my foot and I forgot to say sorry. Or, I'm sorry that I don't always say sorry. Remember how I told you that Americans always say sorry? Well, forget about it. It's the Canadians who always sorry. Americans, in comparison, are just a little sorry, while Canadians say, I'm terribly sorry. Which has become a meme itself. These guys are so polite that even graffiti by local vandals is hard to erase due to its cuteness. Sometimes the locals do things that are very hard to understand for us. A typical story like this happened in a typical grocery store in 2019. Mother's Day is celebrated in February here and most shops are closed throughout the day. But in the small town of Kingston, the doors of a food basic store were open for a whole day since an employee forgot to close it. Meanwhile, there was no security, no employees. The next day everyone returned and realized nothing was gone missing. Some customers came and left, while some even took some goods and left money at the cash desk. If you think Kingston is a quiet village where everyone knows each other, you're wrong. It's a city with a population of over 100,000 people. Ok, let's be real. Can you imagine such situation in your town? I can't. That's the Canadians for you. Like Australia. Canada is a country of immigrants. Around 300,000 people move here every year. Around 180 languages are spoken in Toronto alone. So, if you just listen closely, you will definitely hear your native language in the streets. To understand how loyal this country is to immigrants, just look at this picture. This is Harjit Sajjan, and he used to be Canada's Minister of Defense. Yes, guys, the Canadian Minister of National Defense is an ethnic Sikh. Religious buildings in the city are also very diverse. There is an Anglican church, a Macedonian Bulgarian church, a Ukrainian Catholic church, Buddhist temples, synagogues and more. No one is hiding their heritage here because everyone came from somewhere else and all these nationalities feel very secure in their neighborhoods. Take for example this Chinese boy from Chinatown. Ukrainians are the biggest part of the Slavic diaspora here since over 1 million people have Ukrainian roots. Some of them are the ex-minister of finance Christian Freeland and the lieutenant general of the Canadian army Paul Vinnik. Most people have friends in Canada and so do I. Meet my close friend Julia. She has lived in Canada for over 11 years with her husband Leonid. How long have we known each other? 20? It's a bit scary even to think about it. I think it's been more than 20 years and we were classmates. Once I even shot a wedding film for her. See, I was making films long before it became mainstream. We'll drop by their place a little later to check out how they live here, but for now let's find out if there is anything to see here. Even though over 1 million people visit Toronto every year, I wouldn't call it all too touristy. But there are some cool places here, of course. Let me show you two neighborhoods that I liked. The first is a Kensington Market. It's a big street market that emerged in an old immigrant district. Today it's colorful and very photogenic, with bright graffiti, all sorts of souvenir shops and the cutest houses ever. Residents, of course, match the district. The second place is called the Distillery District. It's an old whiskey manufacturer distillery, the biggest in the world 200 years ago. Today it's packed with cafes, restaurants, photo shoot spots, and it's also a great place for a walk. I want to show you this city from above, but there are three airports nearby, so flying a drone seemed practically impossible. The only way to show you downtown is from the side of Lake Ontario. So, let's head to the ferry terminal and buy a ticket to Center Island.
Holy squirrels! This place is amazing! Central Island is a popular place to relax in Toronto. There are not just an amusement park and Victorian era houses here, but also a huge park for picnics and walks, as well as first row seats to the best use of Toronto. Okay, enough is chillin'. Let's talk about the country's critical problems and last year's main event in Canada. In 2018, Canada became the second country in the world and the first G7 country to legalize cannabis across the whole country. So, Canada is the second, and which country is the first? You probably thought of the Netherlands, Amsterdam, coffee shops and so on. But no, technically wheat is banned in the Netherlands, but it's decriminalized. Possession of up to 5 grams is not considered a crime, although police can still confiscate it from you. You can freely smoke weed only in coffee shop, though. But the first country to ever legalize cannabis throughout its territory was Uruguay. The legal side of weed is quite confusing, but here's a list of countries that partially legalize marijuana for recreation purposes. The keyword is recreational, as the list of countries that allow medical use of marijuana is much longer. The USA legalized weed in eight states and Washington DC, as it was in 2019, although as for federal regulation, cannabis is still illegal there. Now let's get back to Canada. Weed can be used for recreational purposes for those over 18. You can store up to 30 grams at your home and grow up to four plants on your premises. There are even cannabis shops here in Toronto, and I am about to visit Canada's first one, which opened on April 1st, 2019. I'm gonna go now. Let me repeat, we don't advocate weed, but we'll show you an official cannabis store in Toronto. I mean, if such a thing exists, it must be seen. All right, let's do it. I'm quite surprised that there are no queues here, as on the first day of this public sale, this place was packed. Usually the line goes all the way there and around the corner. Everyone gets their ID checked at the entrance. Alright, they checked my ID, made sure I'm over 18, I'm a little bit older, and I'm in. The shop is called The Honeypot, and it's one of the five stores in Toronto that won a license. Yeah, there was a lottery for that, given the overwhelming number of requests. All five of them were supposed to launch on April 1st, but not all made it in time, and those that didn't had to pay a fine to the government. Nothing personal, guys, just business. The Honeypot it's the biggest cannabis store in Toronto. It has three floors, lots of employees, and a massive screen with the products and pricing. Honestly, I feel like I'm in some modern hipster shop that just launched a new product line. The design and the brand identity are cool. It's so well packaged, they really do present the product for you. And the mind-blowing thing is this is all legal. The product on display is nicely packaged and labeled, including its description, composition and flavor. This one is spicy with wooden notes and a little bit sweet. A salesperson can help you pick something specific, like something sedative for better sleep or relaxation, or something more uplifting. You can buy wheat in practically all shapes and forms here. So we have the oils, which either come in a spray or the tinctures, which you'll put under the tongue or on your cheek. And then we have the capsules, which come in 2.5 milligrams, and then we have them in 10 milligrams as well. So it's like a pill, yeah? Yeah. Yep. You can even get it as a pill. The only thing missing is the tar vaporizer. They do sell it, but by law, you can't put vaporizers on this place as they can contain a small amount of nicotine. That's right, they can display wheat, but cannot display any nicotine products. That's Canadian law for you. How do people react, you know, on the legalized? They love it. It's actually, it's such a, it's, it's very strange for a lot of people because we've been waiting for it for 
such a long time. Um, so a lot of people react with like happiness because they finally have seen the day where you can actually buy weed legally um, instead of on the black market and have it such a secret. So it's it's like 100% uh, official, yep. and you're paying the taxes. Yep. So it's kind of like alcohol. Exactly. Yeah. So hopefully over time the system will develop um, in a way that it'll be exactly like the alcohol system. According to the government forecast, Canada's budget will increase by 400 million per year thanks to the taxes from the wheat industry, and it will also help to keep the black market in check. Locals state the legalization of wheat didn't change things a lot since the initial attitude towards it has always been laid back. The cannabis stores opened and they were like, okay. As you may have noticed, the level of tolerance is quite high in Canada, being one of the most developed countries in the world. Downtown is a place where you run into wild colors and may trip over a homeless person peacefully sleeping by the road. The same goes for fashionable coffee houses. There are lots of homeless shelters here in Toronto, where they can have three meals a day, get treatment for drug addiction or psychological assistance. Yellow beans for use needles are an inseparable part of it. During cold winters here, the homeless are forced into these shelters so they don't freeze to death. And interestingly, the homeless sue the municipality for violating their rights to the constitutional freedom of movement by forcing them into the shelters. The people's reaction to a camera is usually pretty aggressive in these areas. Who the fuck did you see? Take a picture of me trying to fucking blow me up. I put your fucking spot in now, you know what I'm really? What's strange is that such hotspots are two minutes away from cozy and clean houses, and I struggle to understand how both of these parallel worlds coexist next to each other. I go out on the street in the morning and look at the lights, the green, the dark green, and I think it's strange that everyone looks like they're blue, like it's a holiday. I think, what's that? Then I started to ask, and they told us that it's because there are a lot of narcotics, И синие фонари для того, чтобы наркоманы к нам в двор не приходили. И, потому что они при синих фонарях не видят свои вены. То есть они не могут там э, колоться. Theft, unfortunately, is also a common thing in prosperous Canada. It was uh, in the locker next to my condo. Somebody broke into it and stole my bike, my motorcycle and my two camera bags. All in all, everything was worth more than $50,000. But luckily I had insurance, <laughs> so I just talked to the agent this morning and they're going to cover me. And the insurance happened by chance, because when I got with my car, they tried to upsell me home insurance. And, oh, it'll cover your belongings even in your locker. And I said, how much? It is a $7 extra per year. I said, put me on it. And in March, I think it was God. <laughs> I'm pretty sure <laughs> God saved me. <laughs> Given all of that, Toronto has a peaceful atmosphere. Look, I'm having breakfast at a cafe, policemen are eating here too, everyone greets each other. The people here are very friendly and you begin to feel it within an hour after you arrive in this city and even this country. Coming back to Toronto, it has left quite a controversial impression on me. I can't say I didn't like the city. I found a cool rooftop bar on the 51st floor on my last day in town, shoot an evening time lapse for you as usual and had a great time. This may be the end of our visit to Toronto, but there still are some important things to do. Firstly, I need to drop by my friends to have a peek at houses in the Canadian suburbs. The Sokol family has two children, a car and the house itself. This is so-called duplex, which means it's a semi-detached house. The house consists of a couple of bedrooms, children's rooms, a few more rooms, the ground floor with rooms as well and a small backyard. Such a house would have cost you at million or the million Now, a few words about the attributes that are almost always present in these houses. <laughs> the first thing is the grill, present in every house. Then there is a snow blower, and it's far from being a luxury item. Right now Leonid showing the level of snow that can fall in just 5-6 hours in winter. Now try to figure out what is this. Well, it's a vacuum cleaner. You grab your vacuum cleaner hose and insert it into this socket. Then you press the button and start vacuuming. This way you don't have to carry an actual vacuum cleaner all around the house, as it's fixed in the garage behind this wall. These holes are all over the house and it's called a central vacuum cleaner. As it usually happens, the truth is born at family dinners.
I couldn't leave Toronto without visiting one of the most famous waterfalls in the world. It's two and a half hours from the city, right on the border with the US. Now guys, let me show you what Niagara Falls looks like close up. Somewhere over there, behind that wall of water, is Niagara Falls, North America's most powerful waterfall. It turns out that Niagara Falls is not one, but three waterfalls. That big one is American Falls, Bridal Whale Falls is a little smaller, and Horseshoe Falls is the largest. Usually it's this waterfall if people are talking about Niagara Falls. It's 53 meters high and almost 800 meters long. Despite the frequent reports, Niagara Falls froze only twice in modern history, in 1848 and in 1912. Honestly, after Iceland, I'm not that impressed by waterfalls, but Niagara Falls is mighty. The question that sooner or later arises when looking at this massive unit is, is it possible to fall into that waterfall and survive? The answer is yes. Attempts to go over the waterfall began two centuries ago. This is Bobby Leach, who went over Niagara Falls in a steel barrel. This is Englishman Charles Stevens, who went over the waterfall in a wooden barrel with an anvil for ballast. Charles' body has never been found. And this is Kirk Jones. On October 20, 2003, he became the first man in history to go down the waterfall without any equipment. Later, he admitted that he just wanted to commit suicide. As fate would have it, in 2017, he decided to repeat the stunt inside a balloon this time. But he wasn't lucky that time, and his body was found 19 kilometers down from the waterfall. All in all, it's possible to survive such a jump, but you better not try it. Niagara Falls is an entertainment center both from the American and Canadian sides. There are casinos, restaurants, parks, and a large observation tower. Basically, a resort. But let's not waste our time, as there is much more to see. I don't want to stay in this city for too long, so now I have a four-hour flight to Calgary, since that's where Canada's main attraction is. Not one, but two national parks. Banff and Jasper. Let's see what it's all about. gas or do you like something small enough to drive anywhere or yeah okay. so we can do this one thank you so much all right nice to see you thank you have a good day, sir. enjoy it's everybody. the first time that i was asked what kind of car i want a bigger or a smaller one the bigger one needs more gas but this one is just right for me nice so we're in the province of alberta home to the most visited national parks not only in Canada, but in the whole world. They have absolutely everything – mountains, lakes, glaciers and unbelievable wildlife. In short, it's a real natural amphitheater. It's a gold mine for someone with a video camera. I'm gonna stay four days here, so… Okay. One adult would be $39. You have to pay an entry fee to the parks, where you get a pass, a guide for the sites, excellent roads with the overpasses for animals, and access roads to all the most amazing places on your path. Almost no buildings along the roads are a huge advantage, and no power lines as well. So you have a complete sense of unity with the nature, even behind the wheel. We start with the Banff, the oldest national park in Canada. Apart from the famous Rocky Mountains, Banff, just like Canada in general, is well known for its lakes, with their phenomenal color of water. The first thing I decided to do was to go directly to Lake Louise. As you can see, people come here not only in camper vans. Imagine taking your Lambo for a trip to the mountains. The first flop of our trip is here. This is what the lake looks like in pictures. And that's how it looks now. 
The lake is 1500 meters above sea level. So while it's May in Canada, this place only enters the beginning of March. But it's not a big deal, as there is another lake nearby, perhaps the most beautiful lake in Canada, called Moraine. Shit. I was in Canada in the middle of May, which turned out too early for these places. Some lakes that aren't too high in the mountains have already thawed, unlike the high altitude ones. This lake could be reached on foot in 3 hours. The road has already been cleared, with cyclists all over it. But the lake itself is right there, high over the hill, and it's still frozen. So I have no other option but to show you what Moraine Lake looks like during summer. This video is not color corrected, so these colors are real. Have some food, brother. Sorry? Have some food. This is some uh, uh, shrimp and this is jackfruit. I'm not sure if you know what jackfruit is with uh, shrimp paste. It's uh, from Philippines. At least this has brightened my day. And just like this, out of nowhere, some nice people from the Philippines, also disappointed by the icy lake, shared their lunch with me. This is so nice, it's, it's people who are the coolest thing about traveling. Now let's get back to Banff. We all have a place of power. For some it's a summer house, for others it's Fuji. My place of power is a park like this one. I really can rest my soul in such places. It has everything you need for a good reset. Mountains and rivers, waterfalls and mountain trails, unbelievable nature and the roads of course. The town of Banff is the tourist center of this national park. It's a small town located at the feet of the Rocky Mountains. I've always been curious about how people live in such towns. Do they stay in love with this beauty or get used to it for… as time passes? Just imagine living in a place like this. I would probably go crazy. As you may have noticed, there is a railroad passing through the Rocky Mountains, and now a bit more about that. I love trains. Not typical trains, but trains in different countries which differ greatly from ours in Ukraine. Here in Canada, more specifically in Banff, there is also one very special train. And I'm gonna tell you why. This is what a local train station looks like from the outside. Inside, though, it's much more interesting. Guys, this is what all train stations should be like. I feel so rich here. The thing is, the train station serves quite a luxury train called Rocky Mountaineer. The most expensive ticket for a 7-day trip on this train costs over 7,000 Canadian dollars. Which is roughly this much. The train operates between Calgary and Vancouver, winding its way through the most beautiful parts of Banff and Jasper. Passengers are greeted by red carpets, gangways and buses that take them to hotels. It's more like a cruise ship. How was the trip? Fantastic. Really? Very, very good. Is it worth it money? Absolutely. Really? Yeah, yeah. We would, I would thoroughly recommend getting the gold leaf service over the silver service. Now to the most interesting part. There are around 500 passengers on this train right now, but it's low season. By August or September, this number will go up to 1000 on one single train. I'll let you calculate the company revenues. Before I unpack, our good old tradition.
Just before I left Jasper, I managed to film a couple of crystal clear lakes that haven't frozen yet. Check out this water, it's a clear as a mirror. So here's the story. Remember how I show you glaciers on Iceland but from afar? In New Zealand I couldn't make my way to them, but Canada is where we get to know them up close. More specifically, this one, the Atabasca Glacier. I would even say as close as it gets. Here in Jasper you can go up to glacier on this huge thing called Ice Explorer with low pressure tires that cost about 5000 bucks each. For comparison, here's a teenager next to it. There were only 24 of these built, two of which operate on Arctic Research Station, and the other 22 are here on the Atabasca Glacier. This machine is super hard to drive, just look how much strain you need only to make a turn. <laughs> its weight is 25 tons, its top speed is a whopping 18 km per hour. But what this vehicle can do well is go down the slopes, at times over 30 to 40 degree angles. Our destination is a few kilometers away from our parking lot, so 20 minutes at top speed and you are on Atabasca Glacier. One small step for a man, one giant leap for this big episode. We are on Glacier, guys. Glaciers cover over 5% of the land on our planet. Moreover, they contain two-thirds of the world's fresh water. The best part about this is that they are amazing architects. A glacier is basically like a giant bulldozer that slowly but surely forms the landscape around it. These rocks, plumb lines and huge valleys are all created by the glacier. The glacier is melting and decreasing in size. It's now only half as big as it was 125 years ago. And this is it now. To better understand the sheer size of the glacier and its rate of melting, just look at that rock over there. That small piece on top used to be part of one big glacier. Just look at how tall it is. This glacier might have been over 700 or 800 meters high. Regarding safety, it's a well-known fact that glaciers are extremely dangerous. A couple of years ago in New Zealand a group of tourists carelessly went up a glacier, they fell through it and died. This is why there is only a small fence of square territory that you are allowed to walk around and it's overseen by professionals who monitor the state of the glacier to predict possible dangers. Apart from the glacier, a bridge 280 meters above the valley is another great thing to see. Not only to see, but to walk on as well. The bridge has a transparent glass floor, so it's not a walk in the park for some. There are also weirdly shaped clouds hovering over the glacier. I've never seen anything like this, to be honest. Banff is famous not just for its glaciers, but also for wild animals that you randomly come across on the roads. You don't have to go anywhere, just drive, and wildlife is all around you. Next to the wildlife there are cars and tourists with cameras. Some locals' wisdom for you. If you see parked cars along the road, you need to stop. Wildlife in a radius of 15 meters. Nevertheless, it's not deer that photographers usually hunt for. 
it's this guy. The black bear. Because of the bears, some tourist trails are closed during spring with these signs. Just for you to understand the rate of the issue, there are additional memos screwed to picnic tables all across the area explaining how to behave if you come across a bear. Don't run, move slowly to the car, bring some dry underwear and better not be alone. So bears do live here, all we have to do is find and feel them. And I'm determined to do this. However strange this may sound, I'm on my way to find the bears. Three hours of search and zero results. No bears. So I decided to continue at dawn. I stopped at the nearby town, checked in at the Sleepy Bear Inn and spent the rest of the time preparing for tomorrow. Thirty minutes later, my first catch. There he is, guys. Ten meters away from me, in his wild habitat, a real Canadian black bear. These bears are mainly vegetarians and scavengers. In these parts of Canada, the bears allow you to come up pretty close, but make sure you're not in their way. The best explanation of the bear's danger for people was given by some writer, who stated that we are like scans to them. We can irritate them, but aren't of great interest to them. So, if it's not hungry and you don't distract it while it's eating, you should be good. I'm not planning to check this, so let's just believe the writer. A souvenir photo. After the quick photo shoot, the black bear took off to the forest. This is amazing. This is what a happy man's face looks like. I met some more of them further down the road. They were peacefully munching on grass on the hills in the company of photographers. Oh, and there was another one who caused a little traffic jam. To summarize Banff and Jasper, if you're into wildlife and nature, these places are must for you. Just consider the season so you don't end up staring at frozen lakes. The time has come to see Vancouver. My good tradition of exploring new places is to walk it out on your shoes on your first day in the city and taking every little detail of it to get an initial impression. Let's do it together this time in Vancouver. The city definitely has its vibe. Lots of stylish teens on the streets, musicians, everyone is relaxed. And there are very cool sightseeing buses in the city. Very old school. Sometimes Vancouver has a Victorian face. Sometimes it's like Amsterdam or New York. But still, it's Los Angeles that influenced Vancouver the most. There is a local version of Hollywood Boulevard with all the typical things like homeless people or beggars with funny boards. Hang on it. Hang on it. Hang on, you leech. Let me take your picture, look. <laughs> Hang on. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Good boy. Good boy. Pick it up, let's go. Come on, pick it up. 
see Bye, see ya. My first impression is it's sick. A very nice place with a special outgoing vibe. But as they say, there is a fly in the ointment. The prices. I've stayed in many expensive hotels before where rooms were over 20,000 bucks a night. And my only conclusion is that there is no need for expensive hotels when you travel alone. That's why I always go for budget options, since I just need a place to sleep. However, in Vancouver I had a problem with finding accommodation even with a bigger budget. I looked up the most affordable option downtown and here's what I paid. Mind you, it's in Canadian dollars and includes 200 bucks deposit, but still this is too much. And let me show you what you get for this money. Overall, it's not bad, apart from one thing. There is no shower and no bathroom, as it's a guest house. So almost $400 in Vancouver gets you only a guest house. I would be swimming in gold if it was Ukraine. It's not just about hotels, but the prices on real estate in general. Take a look at the Global Living Report 2019, which mentions cities with the most expensive real estate in the world. The first place, as usual, is Hong Kong, then Singapore, the third is Shanghai, and the fourth, as you may have guessed, is Vancouver. The funny thing is, it's more expensive than London, Paris, Los Angeles and even New York. At the time of filming, the average property price here is $815,000. And there are many Canadian memes devoted to the land price here. The number of expensive cars is crazy here, pretty comparable to Dubai. Within just 10 meters I saw 5 different Lamborghinis. The same goes for upper-class districts. Apart from cars, there are skyscrapers, lots of greenery and numerous yachts. Even this duck not only has a house, but a personal fountain too. Fountains are everywhere, by the way, not only in upper-class districts, but across the whole city. An interesting fact is that even in the wealthiest district it's forbidden to build anything taller than a set level, being part of a special Vancouver municipality program to protect the views. The rule is that residents of any district in Vancouver must be able to see the mountains, so the buildings downtown shouldn't stand in the way. This exact spot is a bad example, but there is always a solution. An incredible beautiful city. It's time to share some facts about it. Often called Hollywood North, Vancouver is the second city in North America after Los Angeles in TV shows production and third after LA and New York in the production of feature films. Vancouver is jam-packed with acting schools, film studios and casting ads. There are several reasons why so many films are shot in Vancouver. Firstly, the tax benefits, as the municipality returns up to 30% of filming taxes. Plus, it assists with the process organization. Secondly, Vancouver is right next to Los Angeles, sharing the same time zone and being a three-hour flight away. For me, not to back up my claims, let me show you some sites in Vancouver that you surely saw in some famous Hollywood movies. In Mission Impossible 4 Tom Cruise was running across Mumbai when in fact it was the square next to the Vancouver Convention Center. The opening credits of Fifty Shades of Grey were shot at the Vancouver Marina with yachts and expensive district in the background. And finally in Deadpool the scene with the parachute landing was shot here while the billboard was added in post. By the way, for this scene the Georgia viaduct had to be blocked for two weeks. It's super easy to come across a film set in Vancouver. Sometimes there are three or four of them on the same street. First, you find a bright sign like this. Somewhere near it, a line of trailers with equipment will be parked. And lo and behold, a movie set of some film. These guys, of course, didn't say what exactly they were shooting, but they're making a movie for Netflix. No idea what it will be. It's unlikely we'll ever find out, because it's all filmed inside. So you can't get in there, of course. It's hard to get any information on the shooting at all. There's one. Start. I'll say. Yeah. Okay. One that's pretty well known. This is Alex. He's been living in Vancouver for over a year and works in the industry too. Uh, работаю в film industry, занимаюсь производством визуальных эффектов для кино, телевидения. Да, у меня вот жена работает тоже в VFX индустрии, делает 
эффекты для больших фильмов. И даже я не знаю, над чем она работает, потому что у них подписаны очень серьезные контракты, NDA называется, по которым нельзя вообще ничего разглашать, и все фильмы производятся под секретными названиями. То есть, возможно, там какой-то делается Бэтмен, а он называется как-нибудь... Колобок. Да, колобок With the help of pro VFX artist Skilled Hand, I can use a simple example to show you how Canadian Vancouver is turned into an American city in Hollywood movies. Here is the original video of regular alley in Vancouver, and this looks more like Seattle now. If you add a little smoke and a yellow pipe, it will immediately turn into New York City. It's often said that Vancouver is a city that never plays itself in movies. I hope that now you understand how it's done. This city gives the impression of almost a dream city. Although it's far from cheap to live here, of course. Допустим, мобильный телефон, когда у тебя стоит 100 долларов в месяц, и интернет стоит еще 100. В общем, все по 100 в Ванкувере. Да, с коммуналкой, кстати, очень круто. Вода из крана питьевая, за отопление... Короче, ни за что мы не платим, кроме электричества. Почему? Потому что это все входит в арендную плату, а вода идет с гор. Мы платим за квартиру, то, что мы заплатили, это вот вся сумма. Кроме этого, вот мы платим только за электричество. Причем цена на электричество очень низкая. И даже я вот знаю, когда этот бум начался майнеров, которые майнили там биткоины и все такое. Были люди, которые специально переезжали в Канаду, потому что одно из самых дешевых электричеств в мире. Примерно мы платим там 20 долларов в месяц, наверное, за электричество. И, и это все. Алексей и его семья арендовали апартамент в Саус Гренвилл, дистрик 7 метров от даунтауна. Такой апартамент стоит около 1500 долларов в месяц. Это намного дешевле арендовать апартамент в Ванкувер, чем купить один. Я когда увидел Ванкувер, я понял, что вот это то место, где я хочу жить. И если это соединить с тем, что вообще Канада, насколько она открыта для людей, я понял, что здесь я хочу жить. Для меня самое важное, что вот я здесь понял, work and life balance, то есть баланс работы и жизни, он как бы общепринятый в обществе. И даже, скажем, из примеров, что в офисе ни у кого нет мобильных телефонов друг другу. У меня есть какие-то там подчиненные в офисе, и человек, допустим, у него рабочий день закончился, он ушел, я его не могу набрать на телефон, сказать, эй, чувак, вернись, надо доделать. Все, он ушел с работы, у него рабочий день закончился, он ушел. То есть, и это private space. It's not easy to figure out the local way of life in one visit. But Canada turned out much more interesting than I had imagined before my trip. Vancouver is now one of my favorite cities. There is so much to see here. And one of the main things on my list is the orcas. After changing, you and your group looking more like NASA astronauts get on this speedboat. Such boats are also used by the police and marine special forces. It's really fast, so after an hour of a speedy trip, you're in the bay where everyone is looking out for the orcas. Well, here they are, coming up like a group of synchronized swimmers. Filming killer whales is extremely difficult. First of all, you never know where they will surface. And secondly, according to Canadian law, you can't get closer than a couple of hundred meters to them. So I have to shoot from afar. But sometimes something exciting does happen in the shot. Often you just sit and mind your business, hear a gasp and turn around to realize that you just missed something. Orcas hit their tails on the water to stun and disorient fish. Their tails are so powerful that they can toss seals a few dozen meters up into the air. You can even listen to them on the boat. There are special microphones, but on the day they weren't particularly talkative. So I personally didn't hear anything. What sucks most is that the camera, especially from such a distance, doesn't convey the emotion of watching orcas. To be honest, it's so cool that I don't want to leave. I would love to stay here for at least another hour. On my way back, I happened to capture a very rare bird. The one on the right. 
It's a bald eagle, the USA heraldic animal. And lastly, I would like to show you one cover from the air. At the time of the release of this video, a metro flying of drones has already been banned in Canada. And in May, when I was in Vancouver, it was still possible to fly drones, but not above 90 meters. Well, you can't show much from that altitude. Fortunately, there is a way for everyone to see the city from the air. Here, in Vancouver Harbor, there is the airport runway. Well, it's not really a runway, just a zone of the bay where cruise ships, bus and seaplanes take off. The Harbor Air Seaplanes airline is one of the world's largest airlines operating on seaplanes. It has a fleet of 40 seaplanes and carries half a million passengers annually. And it's not just recreational flights, but also regular passenger flights. They even fly to Seattle. Landing a seaplane is more difficult than an ordinary one, because the water surface of the bay isn't always smooth. So the pilots here have special qualifications. Perfect. Thanks so much. Enjoy Thank your flight. Bye. <laughs> Okay, on my way to Canada, I was really worried that there would be nothing to film here. And God, how wrong I was! Banff and Jasper bumbled their way into my heart. And my most unexpected discovery was Vancouver. It's a very cool city. But since Canada is the second largest country in the world, this big episode doesn't cover even 1% of this country. So come to Canada, there is a lot to take in and travel more. It's worth it. <laughs>